I am uh, the Decred project lead. We're going to be talking about applications of blockchain timestamping today. And I am the CEO of Company Zero. Company Zero is a development outfit that does contracting for the Decred project. Very briefly, we developed Decred to address what we saw as a crisis of governance in Bitcoin. I'm not going to get too far into this. We did this because we felt that the people who held the coins in Bitcoin weren't in charge and there was really no sovereignty system to make that work to their advantage. So what we ended up doing was we fixed the things that we felt were, were you know, out of place or incorrect. And our governance system is opt-in. You take coins, you opt-in, you lock them, you get tickets, you use those tickets to vote on things. And that's how we resolve disputes. And the context here is that I'm going to be talking about a governance subsystem that we developed in order to make governance decisions in a transparent way, and then this involves the uh, time stamping. The reason we developed this, this uh, time stamping system called Politea, I'll move a little bit so everybody can see the slides. The purpose of developing it was to create something better than just a website. A lot of interaction in the cryptocurrency space goes on on, say, Bitcoin Talk or Reddit. And if you're familiar with those venues at all, you, you know that there's a lot of censorship that goes on. Sometimes it's totally justified, people just you know running off the mouth. And then in other cases, it becomes very political or ideological. For example, if you try to post certain things to the Bitcoin subreddit, you will get censored and vice versa for the BTC subreddit. We didn't want to create an environment like this, so what we did is that we put timestamps on everything. So, for example, let's say I didn't like someone something someone said, I can't just arbitrarily go back in the past and delete it. The purpose this serves is that it creates an indelible historical record of our governance decisions. Websites are great because they allow people to access data, so we have a web portal for this data, but this data is stored in a, in a format such that you can verify it and make sure that everything that, that you know, was said was said, and that, for example, if I'm censoring people, you can see the censorship, and it's at least nominally transparent. And it's a general solution in the sense that it creates a time-ordered store of data, and this can be used in all kinds of contexts. A brief technical summary of how it works is the following. If you're at all familiar with Open Timestamps, which is uh, work by Peter Todd and company, what we've done is we, we take files, and you'll see them, the, uh, you know, the files at the top of the right of the, uh, you know, of the slide here. We, if we follow the path from the white file down through the white hashes down to the Merkle root at the bottom, that's what's referred to as a Merkle path. And what, what we do is, is that if people submit documents to this DCR time service that runs, they get a hash back the, uh, for their file, and then further, after a number of blocks, they receive the full Merkle path and the transaction that anchored that particular hash. And what this allows people to do is to say that a particular document existed on or before a given date. Politea is, our, is the system that we ended up using for our governance infrastructure, and it's anchored via DCR time. So it's effectively a Git repository where data is committed, and this is things like people make proposals, update their proposals, make comments, and this gets updated every so often. Then once an hour, it um, takes the commit hash, the, 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 the white anchor commit, and then it anchors that into the, into the Decred blockchain uh, the same way that I was uh, referring to earlier in the previous slide. It also adds an identity layer to the data being stored, which is really important. The reason identity matters in the context of data is it really does matter who said what when. You can, for example, I could claim that there was a certain, you know, there was certain content on Twitter.com today, but that's just me attesting to that information. It's it, who says it matters. For example, if Twitter says that certain information was on Twitter's website today, that is, you know, that's a lot more significant than me talking about that. And in, in terms of accountability, who said things really matters. You know, did the CEO say it? Did the board of directors say it? Or did, you know, Jimmy the mail guy say it? These things, these things matter, and so that's the, the utility of identity in this context of record keeping. As I said, this is an extremely generic way to store data and to deal with uh, the, you know, record keeping. 
And there's really only four questions you need to ask if you're interested in integrating this in, in an application is, who are the users, who are the administrators, what are the proposals, and will it be public or private or some combination thereof? And the reason these matter is, is that users submit proposals, administrators make sure that the proposals aren't total junk or you know, full of objectionable material. And then whether it's public or private determines who can access that data after the users post it and the administrators render some judgment on it. I'm gonna give a few examples in the corporate context and then I'm gonna move on to a few examples in the, in the government uh, nation state government context. Financial records are typically uh, submitted, would be submitted into a system like this by uh, people who do the bookkeeping for an organization. The people who administrate it would be the, um, would be the CFO, and then the proposals themselves would be banking records and invoices and purchase orders and so on. And the accessibility would be internal to the corporation. It really doesn't make sense to have internal corporate records publicly accessible in most cases. It could also be used in the context of corporate minutes. Uh, officers and board members need to episodically debate things, add or remove officers, add or remove board members, and then the admin would be the corporate secretary. For example, if someone just starts, I don't know, yelling expletives during one of these corporate minute meetings, they might be like, well, we don't need that in the record, and they'll censor that. And proposals, in this case, would be topics for discussion, like, you know, should we get rid of Jimmy the mail guy because he, he, he you know, he said something publicly on, a, you know, and, and we're, all in, we're all in trouble now. Or, you know, oh, should, maybe we should revise the budget and so on. And again, the accessibility here would be internal to the corporation. In terms of a real world example, a real world example of DCR time being used and uh, indirectly Politea is notary services. And if you're at all familiar with Original My, you may, you may not be because it's a Brazilian service. Original My anchors, um, uh, gives notarized da uh, notarizes data using blockchain timestamps in the uh, Decred, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and at least a couple other currencies blockchains. So that you can show up with a document, get it notarized, and uh, the original my staff makes sure that you paid for it, and then you end up getting a uh, you know notarized document back. This has actually been causing a pretty serious amount of trouble for them in uh, in Brazil. I spoke to them just a few months ago, and they are they're having so much success with this that the note that the notary trade organization there is trying to shut them down and claim that they're not proper properly notarizing things which I found pretty satisfying. So, uh, and then there's, uh, the accessibility is it would be public with an access code. For example, you might submit a document hash and then it goes, what's the access code? You enter the access code and then anyone can be sent a link to verify that a document's notarized. I'm gonna move on to nation state government examples. Lots of records are stored by governments all over the world how much they care about them and how much they want to manipulate them in the past, well, that's up to every government. Some are shadier than others. So let's talk about a few uh, use cases. One of them would be disclosure forms. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of government agencies have agency operatives and they go out and they do things on a daily basis. They watch people, they investigate, they record data, and then they have to put it in a format where it gets recorded. And you know, these formats vary from agency to agency. And the, uh, what is it, the difficulty or impossibility of manipulating these is really, you know, it's valuable to these organizations. So the people who would be administrating this would be the agency management, you know, the, you know, the people who, you know, who are behind the desks as opposed to the people who are doing the investigator investigatory work. And then the proposals would be the forms themselves. You submit a form that says, I went to location X, I performed task Y, and you know, it occurred at time Z, and here's a whole record of everything that happened. And the accessibility could be internal to the government, and then optionally public at a later date via a Freedom of Information Act request, assuming you have such an act in your jurisdiction. In terms of uh, tracking assets, uh, there's a lot of very valuable things that governments move around, whether we're talking about military assets like you know, uh, aircraft and you know, uh, small arms or nuclear weapons or whatever it is, or scientific equipment. These things are incredibly expensive as, uh, you know, as the defense budget demonstrates. And when you're moving this around, there's logistics staff who are making sure that these things get shipped from point A to point B and they actually arrive and they don't go missing or, you know, get lost in the desert. 
and the admins would be the people who manage uh, you know, these facilities or the people who manage that department. And the proposals would be receipts for inbound and outbound sh shipments. You can't go back and change that, uh, like, ooh, man, we lost this one thing. Let me go back and just, whoa, you know, they never sent it to us. You can't do that with a system like this. And then, again, this would be internal to the government and then optionally public at a later date if they, uh, if they were so inclined. A third example in the nation-state government uh, context is political contribution tracking. And this is another one from Brazil. We have a lot of, uh, you know, Brazilian supporters for Decred. In fact, I mean, there's, there's some data to indicate that we have a bigger following in Brazil than in the United States, which it's great, but I didn't plan it. Um, Vot, uh, Voto Legal tracks the donations to political candidates. Political candidates will sign up for this service, and then they have their, then they have their donations tracked, and the, and the donations are tracked publicly. So the political candidates sign up, Voto Legal you know, administrates it, and then the proposals are receipts for campaign contributions. So as these funds flow in, these receipts get made pub, uh, publicly published so that it's not you know, just a bunch of hot money flowing into people's you know, uh, safes or bank accounts. And the accessibility here is public. So let's take a second to talk about what the big picture is here. The big picture is that we're creating a time-ordered file system. If you're at all familiar, you know, Git in a, in a way is a versioned file system. And what we've done is we've added time ordering to that. So that as data is committed to a Git repository, episodically it's anchored and that puts a time ordering on it. And it creates in a way, a you know, in our context for the proposal system, it creates a digital commons where people can interact and cooperate and still be held accountable in a dual-sided fashion. Users are held accountable in the sense that their data is cryptographically signed, and then uh, administrators are, are also held accountable. So if, uh, so if an administrator is you know, going off the chain and just censoring everything and you know, st you know, causing, a, causing a lot of trouble, what they, end up do what they can end up doing is, uh, you know, the, the users can be like, look at this admin, he, you know, they're, they're completely misbehaving, they've gotta go. So what we've done is we've created a transparent censorship mechanism. Accountability really matters, um, as anybody on the internet has, has seen. If you've ever been attacked by an anonymous troll, it's pretty frustrating that it's like, oh wow, this person, you know, it's just a, some random identity attacking me. So creating a, you know, a concept of identity is incredibly important to making people accountable. And when it comes to governance, that's you know, a big part of what governance is. It's keeping people accountable and keeping, uh, you know, keeping the data, uh, you know, stored and correct and not easily manipulated. And we can go back in time and see everything that's happened on uh, one of these, uh, one of these uh, Politea repositories. The heightened accountability is really, really important in audit scenarios. That's why I brought up the, uh, the government and the corporate examples. You know, who, who said what when? Okay, you know, let's say personally, let's say we're all just hanging out and we're doing some kind of Reddit type thing. You know, accountability matters, but then in there, there are places where, you know, there is legally mandated accountability, and Politea is actually an excellent fit for those use cases. And that is it, and if you're interested in asking me questions about this, you can come over and uh, meet with us at our booth over there. Thanks.